It's all true. Uh, so hi, I'm really happy to be here. And unlike most of the other presenters uh, at Astronomy on Tap, I'm not going to be talking about my own work, my own research that I do. I study uh, supermassive black holes that are gravitationally lensed, and I study supernova explosions and exotic objects and globular clusters. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about something else that I just think is really super cool and I wanted to share with you. So if you're anything like me, um, at the end of a long, hard day of work, you know, there's nothing better than going home or going to a bar, opening a beer, and just, you know, chilling out, relaxing with some mindless escapist fare, you know, like a Shakespearean tragedy. Um, <laughs> so if you are like that, then you are in for a treat, because I'm going to be talking about one of the really fascinating layers of the multi-layered masterpiece that is Hamlet. Um, and a lot of this is based on the work of Peter Usher that Penn, at Penn State, who did uh, a very close reading of the text. He's a, uh, he is an astronomer, he studies the history of science, um, and he did a really brilliant interpretation of a lot of the confusing, mysterious, uh, and somewhat opaque scenes in Hamlet and lines in the text uh, to uncover what I think is a, is a really compelling interpretation of a lot of Hamlet. Uh, namely that um, a lot of the characters represent competing views of the universe. Because at the time that Shakespeare lived and when he was writing Hamlet, um, we were transitioning. We were going through a revolution in how we understood the universe. We were moving from a, a geocentric, uh, an Earth-centered view of things that went all the way back to the ancient Greeks to a heliocentric view of the universe where the sun was at the center and the Earth orbited it. And even going beyond that, uh, as I'll explain. But first I want to kind of uh, set the stage and explain some of the competing ideas of the universe uh, that are at play in Hamlet. And as I said, this goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Um, the geocentric uh, model can be traced all the way back to none other than Aristotle, who imagined that the Earth was at the center of the universe, and that all of the stars in the sky and the sun and the moon, they were affixed to spheres, invisible crystal spheres that were centered on the Earth. Um, and the Earth held up these spheres through some sort of transparent rods or some sort of you know, system like that. And they all rested upon the Earth. And beyond uh, the stars that move at night and the sun and the moon, there was a final sphere of fixed stars. And so what accounted for the movement of all of the other stars in the sun and the moon? Well, beyond that final sphere, there was another sphere of the prime mover which was this, this supernatural, all-powerful being that was able to move that sphere and through some, I don't know, invisible levers or pulleys or something made all of the other spheres move. Um, so this supernatural, all-powerful thing named Prime, I always think of Optimus uh, when I think of this, just out there doing his thing and making, causing all the motions in the night sky and day sky to happen. Uh, and this was the the view of the world that persisted for a very long time. There was a problem with Aristotle's cosmology, with his view of the universe. And that problem goes by the name of retrograde motion. Okay, if you're looking at the night sky for months at a time, you will notice a general drift eastward of everything in the night sky. Everything does this. Except there's five objects that for a while anyway, don't do this. They go the opposite direction, and that's what's called retrograde motion. So out of the thousands of things in the night sky that, that follow this general drift, there are five objects that for a few weeks at a time go west, and then they turn around and start going east again. And this is a big problem because this is not how perfect spheres behave. This was a problem with Aristotle's cosmology. So how do you solve that problem? It was worked out by some other philosophers and came to full fruition in the work of Ptolemy, of Claudius Ptolemy. Um, and he worked out this uh, system of epicycles, basically that these, these five things that didn't follow the general trend. The Greeks called these things uh, wandering stars. And the Greek for that is planetus aster. So these, this is where we get the word planets. Planets are these wandering stars that didn't follow the general trend. And the way you work that out is you have these complicated epicycles, and I'm not going to go into detail too much, but Ptolemy really worked this all out in detail. And so we call this old geocentric view of things. We call this the, the Ptolemaic uh, view of the, of the world. And what's amazing is that this theory lasted for nearly 14 centuries. So in some 
regards, you could consider Ptolemy the most successful scientist of all time because his idea lasted far longer than anybody else's. It was just dead wrong. But it lasted for a really long time. Um, and it lasted until along comes Nicholas Copernicus during the Renaissance, who started off this whole revolution in our understanding of the universe. He was a Polish cleric, and he published a book in Latin shortly before his death called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. You probably know this. And he revived the idea that the sun is at the center of the universe, not the earth. And so you can see this is a figure from, uh, from his book where the sun is at the center, the planets are in their orbits going outward, and in that final sphere you could see the immobilis, the fixed ones, the fixed stars. So it was a finite universe still, but the sun was at the center. Now, um, before his death, Copernicus taught some of these ideas to a visiting scholar from Wittenberg University who brought back those ideas to Wittenberg. And that university became the center of, a hel of heliocentric thought in Europe, of a sun-centered view of the world. Not everybody uh, ought to subscribe to the Copernican view immediately. Some people were very hesitant. Uh, one of those people was Tycho Brahe. Uh, Tycho Brahe is a very colorful character in the figure of astronomy. I won't go into too much of his eccentricities and peculiarities um, and the fact that he was just a big jerk. Um, a couple things to know about Tycho Brahe. He was an amazing observational astronomer, by far the most gifted observational astronomer of his day. We heard earlier this evening about Kepler's laws of motion. Kepler der derived those laws working on the data that Tycho Brahe obtained from his observations. So he was a great observer, not so great a theorist. Um, and in fact, this is very evident in one of his uh, most popular ideas that he tried to develop. He couldn't fully buy into the Copernican view of things, but he knew the Ptolemaic view was wrong. So he developed his own theory, this weird hybrid, where the other planets went around the sun, and then the sun went around the Earth. Uh, so he couldn't let go of the idea that the Earth was at the center of everything. I think probably because he was on the Earth and he had to be at the center of everything because he had a huge ego. So it, it never really uh, stood up to close scrutiny, but he was still very proud of his idea and he essentially went on a PR blitz and he sent copies of his theory along with these engraved portraits of himself and his family crest all over Europe. I mean, he literally sent this out all over Europe saying, look how awesome I am. Isn't my theory great? And I come from this awesome line of nobility. And some of these uh, made their way to England to an astronomer by the name of John Dee and one of his pupils, Thomas Diggs, along with a suggestion that some English poets should some compose some witty epigrams of Tycho Brahe and his, I mean, he literally wanted people to sing his praises. Uh, <laughs> So qu quite a character. So um, as I said, some of these went to John D and his pupil, Thomas Diggs. Thomas Diggs is probably the most important astronomer you've never heard of. Um, he was a gifted astronomer, a mathematician, a military scholar. He was a real polymath. And um, one of the things that he is most notable for is he's the first person, the earliest person that we know of, to propose the idea of an infinite universe. This was the Diggsian model of the universe. Very similar to the Copernican view, except instead of that sphere of fixed stars, space extends to infinity. Space just keeps on going and going and going. And, and, and Diggs thought that all of the stars in the sky were just like our sun. Like, he actually got it right. And he's the first, the earliest person that we know of to propose this idea of an infinite universe. Diggs was well known to Shakespeare. Shakespeare knew the Diggs family. In fact, Shakespeare relied on a lot of Thomas Diggs' work on military scholarship that informed a lot of his military epics. And he certainly would have known about his astronomical thought as well. So that's an, an important thing to realize because as I said, there is a way to understand Hamlet in terms of these competing worldviews and, and this, this tremendous revolution in our understanding of the universe that was happening at the time that Shakespeare lived. So Hamlet was, um, yeah, as I said, it was, it was written around this time. And just to give you a, a brief recap of Hamlet, if you don't remember from high school or, or college or the last time you encountered it, uh, Hamlet is a prince uh, of Denmark. He, they live in the castle at Elsinore. His father was murdered 
by his uncle Claudius, who uh, his father's brother, who then married his mother Gertrude. Um, and Hamlet basically pretends to go crazy to buy some time to figure out what's going on. Uh, Claudius, his uncle father, uh, gets a couple of Hamlet's friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, to take, try to take Hamlet to England, where they're going to murder him. Uh, but Hamlet figures this out and plays a, a trick on them and basically gets them killed instead, returns to Denmark. Uh, there's a little bit more scheming, and the play ends in an orgy of homicide. Is, is the short version, right? And that, and that version actually stays pretty close to the original Danish legend that Shakespeare based it on. He didn't make this all up. It was based on a legend. Except that at the very end, Shakespeare did tack on this weird part just out of nowhere that this Norwegian Prince Fortinbras shows up at the end after this military campaign in Poland that was inconsequential. And he salutes the English ambassadors that just happened to be there. And then he gives Hamlet this burial with full military honors, or a real honor to somebody who'd never been in the military. Uh, but that's really significant, as I'll get to later. So as I said, um, Peter Usher did a lot of work really exploring the text and, and showing how there's a lot in Hamlet that supports this view this com uh, of these competing ideas of the universe, of how we understand the universe, with different characters representing these different ideas. And I don't have you know, nearly enough time to go into all of the evidence that Usher, uh, Peter Usher presents, but it's very, I think it's very compelling. And I just wanted to share with you uh, what I find is some of the most convincing examples that there are clear astronomical references in Hamlet. Um, and for that, I will use some clips from the Olivier version of Hamlet and some quotes from the text. And uh, this is, of course, as you know, the only version worth your time to see on the screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to play a clip here, and I want you to pay attention to a couple things. Uh, one is the astronomical language that's used. And also, if you remember, this is from a scene early in Hamlet where his uncle father and his mother aunt are trying to convince Hamlet not to go back to college, right? They don't want him to go back to college. They want him to stay in Denmark. And pay attention to which college they don't want him to go back to. Your intent in going back to school at Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire. And we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye. Our chief is courtier cousin and our son. Le so that's really interesting. One, that, that term retrograde. Uh, that, that term used outside of astronomy was extremely rare before Hamlet. Okay, that was an astronomical term. And you may think, well, that's just coincidence. Except a few lines earlier than this, Claudius actually talks about Hamlet being in opposition to him, which is another very specific astronomical term for the alignment of planets when retrograde motion occurs. And a bit later in the scene, he actually talks about uh, Claudius and Gertrude being in conjunction with, with each other which is another astronomical term for, the, for a specific alignment of planets. So, you know, you might ascribe one to just a coincidence, but three references to uh, the same phenomenon in this scene is more than coincidence. That was on purpose. And they're talking about Wittenberg, right? That's the school you go to to learn about this stuff. That was well known at the time. I mean, the equivalent of this today would be like, you know, President Obama talking with his daughter about like going to Liberty University. Right? Or you know, like, oh my gosh, that is the one run by Jerry Falwell. That's where they go to learn about that kind of stuff. Right? This was, this was a clear sign. You go to Wittenberg to learn about that stuff. This is a, a, another political equivalent. With, this is how Shakespeare would say New York values. Right? We all know what they study at Wittenberg. Right? It's that weird, that, that new idea that his, his parents, who are representing the past, don't subscribe to. And then his mom also says... Uh, that she doesn't not thy to... mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. Don't go to Wittenberg, right? Don't, don't share in those, those New York values, those Wittenberg values. Stay here with us. And, and, and just to weird you out, in the rest of the scene, his mom tries to make out with him. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, it is a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle... Yeah. A as I said, a multi-layered play, okay? We're, we're not going to get into that now. We're just going to start talking about the astronomy. So, so, clearly, Hamlet, having studied at Wittenberg, 
in the beginning of the play, he is representing this Copernican view of things. You go to Wittenberg to study about the Copernican revolution, this heliocentric theory. His uncle father, Claudius, represents the geocentric universe of Claudius Ptolemy. I mean, like, if there's an easy way for a character in your story to stand in for another person or idea, it's to name him after that, right? <laughs> So Claudius is representing this old school way of thinking, but there are also other references. And again, I don't have time to go through everything, but really clear uh, characterizations of Claudius as representing this geocentric view of the world. Rosencrantz says to Claudius at one point that the king is this massive thing to which these countless other, these, these 10,000 lesser things are affixed like spokes to a wheel, which is exactly the idea, the geocentric idea of Ptolemy and Aristotle, where you have these 10,000 stars in the sky that you can see all resting upon and affixed to Earth. That's the center of everything. So, so Claudius is representing this Ptolemaic way of thinking. Hamlet, in the beginning, is representing the Copernican view of the world, but if you remember anything about Hamlet, you probably remember, hopefully remember, that he undergoes a transformation. Every college essay on Hamlet talks about the transformation that he goes through. Okay, this transformation was actually called out by Claudius, describing it to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, that Hamlet has changed so much that, that he doesn't resemble the person he used to be either on the outside or on the inside. And I think this is a, a key uh, idea in the play, in this understanding of it as this view of competing cosmology, that Hamlet is, is, is going representing this change from a Ptolemaic view of the world, which is finite universe centered on the earth, and he starts in a Copernican frame where the universe is still finite. The exterior is still fixed, but the interior part has shifted. Instead of being centered on the Earth, it's centered on the Sun. And then finally representing this transition to the Diggsian view that Shakespeare was aware of, where not just the inner part, where the center has changed from the Earth to the Sun, but the exterior part has changed as well. The exterior part has expanded to be infinite. And Hamlet himself talks about this. He says to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that he could be confined to a small region and still count himself a king of infinite space. This is an amazing line. The idea of infinite space was not common before Diggs. Okay, that, that's something that maybe you and I take for granted. But before Diggs, that was almost unheard of. So why is Hamlet talking about infinite space? Because he's representing this idea moving forward. It's exactly what Diggs was talking about. There's a lot of other astronomical uh, references in the text. I'm just going to talk about a couple more. Uh, Tycho Brahe is, is uh, there are clear references to Tycho Brahe in Hamlet. In particular, in the characters of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, these would be the characters that represent that weird hybrid Tycho Brahe view of the world. Now, one of the things about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that has confounded scholars for hundreds of years is where those names come from. Why did Shakespeare choose, as one scholar put it, these mouth-filling trifles of nomenclature? I love how English professors talk. So Peter Usher would argue that he didn't just pull them out of the air. If you go back to that portrait of Tycho Brahe, that engraved portrait that he sent all around Europe, you will notice that two of the crests, two of his ancestral crests, are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And these were crests that were sent, that Thomas Diggs had, that Shakespeare almost certainly saw. Okay, so again, I could, I could talk about a little bit more of the references to Tycho Brahe. I just need to give you a little geography uh, primer first, which I know if there's one thing people love more than Shakespeare, it's geography. <laughs> yeah, so... Okay, so this is where things were happening in Europe at this time. Uh, Tycho Brahe on his, on his uh, island in Venn that he was, was given, his, his own private island was making these observations. Wittenberg is due south. Copernicus over in Poland digs in England. And if you look at where Tycho Brahe's castle was, Venn, uh, or Vane, that's the island there, that's where Tycho Brahe's observatory was. Elsinore, the castle where, all, all, where Hamlet takes place, is north-northwest of there. And that's where... Claudius is, representing the Ptolemaic view of things. And of course, the Copernican view, Wittenberg, is due south. And there's this curious line that Hamlet says. And this is a reference to Tycho Brahe. 
And the under the way to understand this line of being mad north northwest is that when you're getting your influence from where the Ptolemaic view of, of things is coming from, it, you're crazy. It just doesn't make any sense. But if you're getting your influence from the south, from Wittenberg, that's when you can see things clearly, and that's when you understand what things are really representing. So again, there's a lot more that I could talk about, but what I want to end on is actually the end of the play and the connection to Poland, this weird thing that Shakespeare tacked on at the end. And in fact, before the end of the play, we get some indication of what this is about. Hamlet asks a captain in Fortinbras's army, how is the military campaign going? What's it all about? And the captain is a little confused and he, he admits, he's like, well, actually, the whole point of this it really doesn't make sense. We're going to gain this small patch of ground that has no worth to it except the name attached to it. And I think at this point, you, you probably know the name that would be attached to a small plot of ground in Poland would be Copernicus. So, the, so this is probably some sort of uh, uh, homage to where Copernicus is buried, his small patch of burial ground. And this happens at the end of the play, after Claudius, representing the Ptolemaic view, has died, after Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, representing Tycho Brahe's view, have died. What happens is we have an homage to Copernicus, to the, to the small patch of land in Poland. And then Fortinbras, after being successful there, paying homage to Copernicus, comes back and salutes the English ambassadors, who just happened to be there, representing the English astronomers, Diggs, who really carried forth that transformation, that full revolution of our understanding, going from that finite geocentric world, come full circle, or, or not full circle, but to go well past that to this infinite space where the sun is at the center of our solar system and all the other stars are just like the sun. So again, there's a lot more there, but this is just some of the most compelling parts that I wanted to share with you tonight. So thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Mind blown, right, guys? <laughs> ah, so good. I love that. Uh, all right, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Dawn, right up here. Is there analysis of this? Does Hamlet or have you also looked So again, this, this isn't my work, but other scholars, especially after Peter Usher's initial work, have looked into whether there are other astronomical references in Shakespeare's other works. And there's a lot, there actually are a lot of them. Um, and actually, some of the most interesting things that, that I, I found when you look at astronomical references in his other works is there are what could be taken as pretty clear references to sunspots in some of his other works. And the most amazing is that there are probably references to the phases of Venus in some of Shakespeare's other works. Now, for the, for, if you remember your astronomy, the phases of Venus can only be seen with a telescope. This is one of Galileo's most important observations. And what this would mean is if Shakespeare knew about the phases of Venus, that must have meant that there were telescopic observations in England, likely due to Thomas Diggs, about 40 years before Galileo pointed a telescope to the sky. So, so again, that is not ironclad, but it's really, really uh, interesting. And it's, I think, fascinating to think that maybe Shakespeare himself might have actually seen the phases of Venus before Galileo. So yeah, there are there are a lot of other astronomical references. Right here. Yeah, Derek. Are there any references to Diggs in Swagger? Are there any references to Diggs? Well, in fact, one of the things I had to skip over was, um, I will show this because I think this is too great. So <laughs> <laughs> one thing we know for sure we know that Shakespeare loves puns, right? There are a lots of examples of Shakespeare's puns. I, I won't, I won't, I was gonna show the clip where he talks about, uh, where he talks about speaking of, of country matters, a reference to the vagina. Um, but, but I won't show that, he loves puns. And so the mo one of the most famous scenes in Hamlet is the scene in the graveyard with the digger, right? And so this, this I think, is a visual pun that Shakespeare put in here. Is the visual pun of somebody digging, I think, is, is a reference to Thomas Diggs. And in fact, in that scene, Hamlet says to Horatio, 
This is an amazing line. Here's fine revolution. And we had the trick to see it. This is in the graveyard digging scene. That, that how amazing is it? Shakespeare realized that there was a revolution in how we were thinking about the universe. And he had the good fortune, the dumb luck, the trick to be alive while it was happening. So, so I would argue that that is a pretty clear reference to Diggs. Yeah. Another question here. All right, the Trinity alum there. Tiger Pride. <laughs> One of you ask a question. <laughs> I'm having a little fun. Okay, uh, first of all, a reference uh, early in the play uh, to the star west of the pole, which would have been Cassie at the time. Uh, reference to Tico Brahe's Supernova? I think almost certainly, yeah. Yeah, so, so there, there is a reference to a star in Cassiopeia. Uh, Tycho Brahe um, made uh, famous observations of a supernova that exploded in our Milky Way galaxy. It was visible uh, all over Europe, a really bright star. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty clear reference to one of Tycho Brahe's main contributions. Right here in the front. Wow, that's that's a. I'm gonna repeat this so everybody hears that. He said he knows Hamlet pretty well, and he was blown away by this. So, I am being pointed upstairs, right there. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to wade into the whole who wrote Shakespeare's plays controversy because my, my take on it is this. Whoever wrote Hamlet was a genius. Um, and and I, don't, I don't care if it was the person that we think of as named Shakespeare or not. Whoever wrote it was a genius. I think was clearly knew about what was happening in England at the time with the, uh, the scientific revolution happening and Diggs's contribution to that. All right, one more question here right there. Uh, yeah, so I'm glad somebody brought up Bruno. Uh, if you don't remember, he was an Italian scientist um, who was uh, burnt at the stake uh, for his for his uh, insistence on things like this. He also proposed the idea of an infinite universe independently from Diggs probably about a decade later uh, and independently. He came up with it on his own as well. So uh, how did Diggs come up with it? Again, I think it's there's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to Diggs probably had a telescope and he probably realized just like Galileo did, once you point a telescope to the sky and you see things that nobody had ever seen before, it's not a, a far leap to imagine that it just keeps going and going and going. All right, with that Energizer Bunny reference, <laughs> let's thank Professor X Ray. Oh, thank you. <laughs>